Just Warhound does chemistry. So you need to know your reaction mechanisms in A Level Chemistry. And some people, and maybe me, can have a hard time remembering the reaction mechanisms. So I thought I'd make a video about them myself. Now if you're a long term subscriber, you might recognise this from videos way back when I used to review figures and stuff in this saggy uh, cabinet. So let's get started and I will be using these. So first I'll be going over the mechanisms that you sort of need to know uh, and that is to draw the diagrams with. Now I won't be drawing any diagrams uh, in this video but I'll be showing what's going on. So first we'll go over electrophilic addition. And what we have here is an alkene, it's ethene to be precise. And here we have a hydrogen halide, in this case it is going to be uh, HCl. So this ethene molecule has a very high electron density around the double bond. And this hydrochloric acid HCl, well it's HCl, um, is polarised whereby there is a delta positive and partially positive charge on that hydrogen and partially negative on the chlorine. Due to the um, delta positive charge on the hydrogen we're going to get bond breaking in this double bond. So that happens basically. Um, a pair of electrons goes to the hydrogen and then under heterolytic fission another pair of electrons goes to the chlorine. So we go from this to... So what we have here is a carbocation which is going to uh, attract to this chlorine ion at this point because it now has uh, a lone pair of electrons and we're going to get a bonding going on. So what happens is we go from this to this. In cases where you have a sort of simple halogen element, uh, let's say this is uh, Br2, it's a little bit different. Now since Br2 is not inherently polar, how is this going to work? Well, the high electron density inside this double bond area polarises the Br molecule. So what you have is a partially positive delta, uh, positive bromine there, and I should say there, and a partially negative uh, bromine there. So what happens then is that it's pretty much the same thing as last time. You're going to have a pair of electrons come apart from there. And then you can have one of the bromine atoms moving to the former alkene, like so. And now what we have is a carbocation and a bromine ion with a lone pair of electrons. Now it's pretty obvious to see what happens next. Bang! Here we have the product. But what about in situations where you have more than two carbon atoms in the chain? Let's take a step back here and say that we're using a hydrogen halide, in this case we're using HCl. Let's have a look at what happens when we run this reaction. So as usual, uh, the region with high electron density will be attracted to this partially positive hydrogen atom. And we'll get a pair of electrons moving over here. And then... Well, take a look at what happens next. The hydrogen atom could potentially bond to that carbon or that carbon, and this is where it gets interesting. So most of the time what happens is that we get this binding with this. Like so. There is the carbocation, there is the halide ion, and there is the bond. This has formed 
what's called a secondary haloalkane, or in this case, chloroalkane, because the carbon that the halogen is, is bonded to is attached to two other carbon atoms. So as you can see, back here, the hydrogen could go there, but it could also go there. Let's make the hydrogen bond to that carbon, as you can see. And consequently, this halide ion, or in this case, this chlorine, chloride even, ion, is going to go here, forming this. And as you can see, this is different to this. Notice how this uh, halogen is on carbon 1, while this halogen is on carbon 2. Now this is known as a primary haloalkane because the carbon to which the halogen is, is uh, bonded to is connected to only one carbon atom. Now primary haloalkanes are inherently less stable than secondary haloalkanes. Therefore when you carry out a reaction like we did this is going to be more frequently produced than this. And this is known as the major product and this the minor product. So, why is that less stable than that? Well, it's because this carbocation is less stable than that carbocation. So, consequently, that's going to be more common than that. It's also worth mentioning that in the reactions we've just been through, um, they are known as electrophilic addition because we have an electrophile accepting electrons um, and uh, an electrophile also accepting electrons here. And the organic um, compounds will be acting as nucleophiles as at, least, at least at the first stage of those reactions. Let's move on to nucleophilic substitution. Just for Honda's chemistry. So let's take an innocent alcohol, in this case methanol, going about their business. And let's introduce this innocent alcohol to um, HCl, or any, I, I assume, um, hydrogen halide, though for this example we're using HCl. What's going to happen? Well, I can tell you what, it doesn't end well for this poor alcohol. If we look at the distribution of electrons in this alcohol, there isn't much there. And that leaves a small area of positive charge to which a molecule with a permanent dipole like HCl will happily move to. So what we have here is a process known as back-end nucleophilic attack. Um, and it basically, it's what it says on the tin. Um, let's see what happens. So as a pair of electrons from this chlorine goes to the carbon, this then pushes another pair of electrons to this oxygen. So oxygen, as we know, already has two lone pairs there. So what happens is oxygen basically says, see you later, mate. Now watch what happens. So now we've got this, and what we're left with is this, which has decided to come back, and this. Well, what do you know? We made some water. We have a haloalkane and some water. But if it can go this way around, who's to say we can't reverse this and go the other way? Let's take an innocent haloalkane going about its business, and let's introduce it to NaOH. Now we don't really care about the uh, sodium here.
What we care about is this hydroxyl, uh, no that's not how you pronounce it is it? What we care about is this hydroxyl ion here. What we care about is this OH- ion here. And this poor back end of this innocent um, haloalkane. Well, I know what happens next. Do you? Back end nucleophilic attack. So we have electrons um, jumping off here and landing here. And we have electrons moving from here to there. And then chlorine says, bye. Now, of course, what happens next is, well, we go from this to this to this. And oh, look, we've got an alcohol again. But wait. Remember that? That's our chlorine that said bye earlier. But wait. There's something else in the solution. Can you hear it? Yep, so that's the sodium we didn't care about earlier. I wonder what's going to happen here. Oh look, sodium chloride. No! Just war harm does chemistry. But, there's more! Let's take an alkene. What can we do with this alkene, I hear you ask? Let's find out. Now thankfully you don't have to know the reaction mechanisms for these. But you still have to know the likes of the reaction conditions, and the catalysts, and the reagents. Let's turn this alkene into an alkane. That was meant to be a giant metallic lattice, but I don't quite have the resources for that. In order to do that, we need to put it on some nickel. And because we want to turn a CnH2n, into a CnH2n plus 2, we need a bit of hydrogen. Now it won't just do anything now, you still, have, you still need more. It has to be hot. 150 degrees Celsius. And you need 5 atmospheres of pressure. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh look! Oh, it's an alkane. But what if we wanted to turn an alkene into an alcohol? Well, there's a whole different process for that. A nice pun there. A hole? A hole? Ha ha! You also need your reagent. The closest thing you get to a swastika in A-level chemistry, also known as H3PO4, or even phosphoric acid. And 500 degrees Celsius. 50 atmospheres of pressure. Whoa, what's that? I think I can hear something above the screaming. Whoa! Of course the catalyst hasn't been used up. We can get from this a secondary alcohol or a primary alcohol or both. Probably both. So great, you've got your alcohol, but what are you going to do with it? Let's condense this and find out what happens. So this is a condenser and that's a Bonson burner and water goes in there and out there. And there is the reaction vessel. Also, here's the reaction vessel. There's our alcohol. Let's add some acidified dichromate. Alright, so I know what it looks like. That's a sulphur. Okay, I ran out of six whole metals. Just pretend it's a metal. Okay, can you do that? Oh, and whilst we're here, it's probably worth mentioning that the dichromate and it probably the acidified bit as well, is actually a reagent as it is used up in the reaction, not a catalyst. 
So, we've got a reaction going on here, and this alcohol reacts once, aldehyde evaporates, and due to the water, condenses. back into the reaction vessel first time like so but wait we're not done yet there's another reaction going on here and here we have a carboxylic acid and it's pretty much done at least um, as far as we're concerned so here's our product uh, ethanoic acid specifically but what if we don't want a carboxylic acid what if we want an aldehyde well, there's a way to do that as well. This is another condenser. Uh, it's just at a different angle. So you can tap it off into this beaker here. There's a thermometer. There's water going in and out. There's my Bonson burner. And there's my reaction vessel also here, containing my alcohol. Now, as we did last time, let's add some acidified dichromate. And watch the magic happen. So there's a reaction here, and we get this alcohol. The alcohol reacts once, evaporates, condenses, but this time it's tapped off. We've got ourselves an aldehyde, specifically propanal. So that's all fine, but what if we have a secondary alcohol instead of a primary alcohol? Let's reflux this to find out. So we add some, say it with me, acidified dichromate. Let's react them. So it rises, falls back down into the reaction vessel. Da da! We have a ketone. Propanone specifically. Just for Honda's chemistry. So how do you get alkenes from alcohols? I'll show you how it's done. So first you need some heat. It's no specific temperature, it's just heat. And then you throw in some concentrated uh, sulfuric acid. Then get a reaction over 20 molly mods a year are the victims of abuse with a better support network we can put an end to this and maybe even stop some from ending it all. Call or text no more to our telephone number or visit our website www.stopviolenceagainstmollymods.org Alright, so you wait for a little and then you get that. Let's pick it up. Alkene. Job done. And it's the same process for secondary alcohols as well them together, you wait, and then you get that. Now if you remember, um, one of the first things we did with this is that we looked at how we can turn an alkene into a haloalkane. Here we're going to turn an alcohol into a haloalkane. Now today we're going to be concocting some bromoalkane or bromopropane. Um, and to do this, we're going to need HBr. But the problem is, HBr is not very stable. So we're going to need to make HBr. To do that, we get some NaBr and some dilute, hence the water, uh, sulfuric acid. And if you want me to make that really dilute for you, I'm just putting that in the puddle of water. Extra dilute. 
So basically what happens out of this mess right here is this and more but as far as I know um, the rest doesn't matter at this stage. So we're going to add this to that and then we're going to get our desired product Promo Propane. But one last thing, what if I decided that I didn't want this anymore and I wanted my alcohol back? Well, there's a simple answer to that called NAOH and throw that in there and there you go. You've got your alcohol back, congratulations. Just Warhol does chemistry.